again later. Hello everyone and welcome to our final session and our final keynote for Aussie Live 2015. We'd like to welcome Sophie Murphy who is a, a, te a teacher and educator from Melbourne. She uh, has recently been working with Professor John Hattie and she's going to present us um, some information about the solo taxonomy, which I know a little bit about, but I'm interested in learning some more. So welcome, Sophie, and thank you for, for presenting for us. Um, I'd like to, no worries. I'd like to thank the Learning Revolution Project in particular, um, and Steve, in particular Steve Hargaden for, all, for, for helping us to organise this with, um, with you. Um, we'd like to thank him for his uh, use of the, the Blackboard Collaborate room. Uh, without him helping us, we wouldn't be able to bring this to you. Uh, and therefore, we thank Blackboard Collaborate as well. Uh, the Australia E series is the team of people that have brought you the Australia, the, the Oz series conference this, this, long, this long weekend, it seems. Um, so, thank you to everyone in the Australia E series team who has put in so much effort and hard work over the last few days and last few months getting this all ready and organised for you. So um, I'd like for us all to just pick up a little icon and drag it across to where you are in the world. I'm going to put mine on the border of New South Wales and Queensland, which is where I am at the moment. I'm in between states. Kind of. I'm in Queensland right now, but by this afternoon I'll be back in New South Wales ready for work. Lovely. We've got lots of people sitting in, and there's Peggy in Arizona. Lovely. Oh, and uh, are you on your iPad, Shambles? Would you like me to put you in Thailand? I'll put you in Thailand. <laughs> there you go. So we've got quite a lot from Australia, a couple from America, which is fantastic. And anyone that um, is on a, a mobile device, just type into the chat and we'll make sure we recognise you. Lovely. Thank you, everyone. So what I will do now is I will hand over to Sophie. And we thank you very much for coming to talk to us today. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much for having me and um, what an exciting opportunity to engage with people from all over the world. Um, I'm going to go through the solar taxonomy. I've just, um, as uh, Shingo and Vanessa said, I've been working with Professor John Hattie for the past three years and um, I'm just about to finish my Masters and hand in my thesis tomorrow actually. And um, I started this journey with, with Professor Hattie looking at what is effective classroom dialogue. So to give you a little bit of a background about myself, I'm, I am still in a school. I'm working in a kinder to 12 school, or actually an ELC to 12 um, school here in Melbourne, an independent private school. And I've worked in public and um, independent settings. It's been a really exciting journey working with John and looking at what is the most effective type of classroom discourse. Um, I conducted the study at my own school and uh, yeah, it's been um, quite a, an interesting part because John, within his work in visible learning, really wanted to look at whether effective classroom teacher talk was actually dialogue versus monologue. And as the study went on and as we started looking at what students thought of what an effective classroom discourse um, is, then we started to really see that uh, it wasn't actually dialogue versus monologue. It was actually really the type of discourse that was occurring and was it surface level learning, like was it primarily rote and recitation or was it um, uh, how do we get into that deeper level learning? And the most effective teachers seem to have what was effective discourse and deeper level learning. So my question and John's question was, well, 
what is this deep level learning? What does it look like? So I started thinking about solo taxonomy and using solo taxonomy and implementing solo taxonomy uh, within the K-12 school with the K-12 teachers. So this, um, this presentation is going to go through how I went about and how I started looking at the solo taxonomy as a tool um, to start looking at surface to deep level learning. So I'm just looking at a few of the questions that are here. So the, the topic of the master's thesis is what is the most effective type of classroom discourse, um, which was primarily looking at teachers, teachers talking and teacher talk. And I actually went into that as a teacher who talks all the time and someone who loves to talk. And I always thought that I was being a really effective teacher. Um, I started in primary setting, but thinking I was a really effective teacher by talking a lot. Um, it, so it was really interesting to start this journey and to start looking at it. I'm actually continuing, when I hand in my thesis tomorrow, I'll be continuing on with a PhD with, um, with John Hattie looking at solo taxonomy. So I'm really keen to find out more about the notion of surface to deep level learning, what it looks like, how can teachers effectively use this taxonomy, or perhaps John and I will look at um, developing our own taxonomy that's quite similar to that of the solo taxonomy and, and brings in a lot of the principles of the solo taxonomy, but maybe is a little bit more user friendly. Um, so yeah, so he said I could have a day off and then move on. So I might have a few more days than a day off. But I'll be really excited to share with you um, a lot of practical examples um, about how you're able to use and implement the solo taxonomy within your own schools or within the education setting. Um, and, and there are a lot of great resources. Pam Hook, who is in New Zealand, was a great starting resource for me. Um, she's got some brilliant uh, tools online and resources online um, and obviously in John's book um, there's a lot of research and uh, he talks a lot about uh, a teacher called Steve Martin who's really accessible and really lovely to talk to about solo taxonomy. I'm always uh, accessible um, by email um, and I'm happy to talk more about solo taxonomy to anyone who wants to follow on. So we'll have a little work through this. Okay, so we're going to have a look about at, at these key areas. So we're going to have a look at what the importance of questioning and dialogue. So this is where the research really began with surface to deep level learning. It introduced you to the solo taxonomy. So if you uh, like you said, Julie, that you're new to solo taxonomy um, and and other people are, are fairly new to it. Perhaps if you can let me know um, if you are new to it, the people who are logged into this presentation um, so that I've got a, a bit of an understanding about um, where you're at with solo taxonomy. Oh, okay, I've closed mail application. Can you, I'm not sure how I do that, Chingo. though. Are you able to help me if I can close that? I'm not really sure. I've got a big brand new Mac here, so I'm on that today. I probably shouldn't have done it on my computer that I'm not that familiar with. <laughs> um, let me know. Uh, um, I think what Shingo's just talking about is we can see your mail and pinging in the background. Uh, okay, so do you know how I would close that? I'm just going to... I just don't want to lose you guys. Uh, let me just give me a moment. Let me have a look. So while so we're doing that, that um, if you want to select yes or no in the poll above, on, uh, where the names are, if you have yes, I, I have these solo taxonomies or no, I haven't or I've not heard of them. Um, this is like just like that. If you haven't, um, if you can't access that because you're on a mobile device, just type in the chat. If you can't do it, so it's okay, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I think that, yeah, I'm hoping that that's got a half and half response so far. Good analysis and quit. 
now. Mail, yep, up there. Oh, I hope that's okay. And click mail. Okay. All right, I think I'm okay there. Thank it's you. I'm going to publish that poll on the whiteboard for you. Okay, so there's the um, poll responses there on the whiteboard for you. Okay. Um, so some people obviously can't um, respond because they're on, on mobile devices. But okay. about, about three, three people have heard of it, three people haven't, and there'll be some more in the chat. Okay, brilliant. Um, well, that, that gives me a good scope there that, you know, some people are, are very new to it. So we'll go through exactly the introduction of, um, of, of what it is, why to use it, what are the benefits and how you can use it in your classroom. Okay. Um, I'm really happy to provide these slides and I'm really happy to share anything and everything. I've got a lot more. Uh, resources and slides and videos and a whole range of different things. So certainly make contact with me and, and I'm happy to share this and more with you. I just really um, like to, as a beginning point, um, really start with the basics of solo because I really think that that is the most powerful um, powerful way to, to really begin your journey. So um, at the end of my presentation, I've got my contact details there, so I'll be able to pass all of that on to you um, and email you or um, share some resources with you. Um, so as I said, I started off the journey looking at what is effective classroom discourse um, and like a lot of John's work is seen through the eyes of the students. So it was really looking at what was effective talk from their point of view and certainly when I started looking at what was effective classroom discourse and teacher talk from the student point of view, it was really different to, to what I thought was effective classroom discourse. And certainly we all know as teachers that there are many students who may sit in front of us and nod their heads, look like they're engaging, but really they, they could be quite passive learners looking out the window, not really engaging in what we're saying. And as teachers, we think that we're sharing a lot of um, really useful information that might be really useful to us and we're very excited about it, but uh, the children are not able or students are not able to remember that information, to make connections um, and, and transfer those understandings. So it was, uh, it's a really great area in, um, to start researching. Um, the starting point was that this whole notion of listening and more listening and less talking. So by listening more, you're allowing students to engage with each other and have discussions with each other and you're able to listen, but also listen to students' responses and give them time to respond. But um, like my master's thesis that is uh, going in tomorrow, there's, it's obviously a little bit more complex than that. And um, yeah, again, I'd be happy to share more information about teacher talk and classroom discourse with you. So to, to sort of start it, as we know as teachers, we can have a range of students in our class and we often ask students or we might pitch our, our lessons to the middle and, and really look at, at higher and, and lower ways to, to work in or what is that notion of differentiation within our class. Um, or do we ask the students to take that same exam, which may be the VCE exams if you're here in, in Melbourne uh, or your, so your final uh, year 11 and 12 exams or our national exams being on that plan test, we're asking our students to sit those same exams, um, but they obviously come with a different, a, a range of different areas. My background was uh, also in um, gifted education and specialist. So I had a really strong background and um, knowledge in that area and I, so I, I had come from um, using, uh, differentiating within my class or perhaps having a little bit of a fixed mindset in a sense that I, I grouped students as, as we all do in some ways and I didn't really, I wanted to move away from that. I really wanted to look at how I could provide opportunities, um, provide opportunities for all students within my own class and I'm not actually teaching my own class now, I'm, 
I mean, a, a leadership position within the school with K to 12 role. I'm able to work with teachers to ensure that they have that impact and how can they ensure that they are offering um, opportunities for all learners. So that's what I like talking about to start. Solo taxonomy was something that um, that that I straight away grabbed onto and, and I was really keen to take from a research point of view of working with John Hattie through into my school. I've tried to bring different things into the school and, and they've had some effect with some teachers and limited effect with others. Um, I started by doing a, a whole uh, school session with the solar taxonomy at the very beginning of uh, the very beginning of last year. And I came in from, uh, just to, to sort of give it a bit of a context, we at the school were using Understanding by Design, we were, had just started online reporting, uh, we were looking at formative assessment and how to do that and how to integrate with online reports, so continuous online reporting. We just put in restorative practice, cognitive coaching, and as you know, if you're in that school context, that when all these things are happening, how do we give teachers that knowledge and the research, but without an overload and um, and do it properly? So when I started reading about solo taxonomy and looking at, at questioning and how do teachers uh, question correctly and how do we use this, how do we use the notion of teacher talk really well? What do we do? Um, solo, um, solo taxonomy seems to fit really well. So I didn't want to go in and say to the teachers, here's something new. I wanted to really look before I gave it to the teachers. I really believed in it. What I believed in was the um, simplicity but the robust nature of solo taxonomy. So Vanessa, as you say, yep, we're, we're in overload and um, and, and all schools are an overload. There's always something happening and whether, you know, they might all be wonderful things, but how do we make sure that it's having an impact in the classroom and with the teachers? So I introduced it, I uh, used this particular slide, and I broke down what the solo taxonomy was and how to, how we could look at learning a little bit differently. So I'll go through it with you now. So basically this, um, this diagram shows the five different areas. So the five different areas down here uh, on the left hand side um, that just move this out of the way that show the pre-structural. So that's the that's the, the time where um, I started by saying unsure, and this is the point. We it, it's it's where, but I've probably got a bit beyond that now, and not so much misses the point, but. Um, more about that they've never been introduced to a topic before. So we're talking about a topic being taught within the classroom. The students have got no knowledge of that. So they've got no knowledge at all. Um, and then we've got unistructural, where uh, the student has one idea uh, about the subject. They can, they can perform very single tasks. And this is where teachers at this point are able to identify um, so they're able to do things like um, identify, name, draw, label, find, match, follow, and follow simple procedures. So it was really good to introduce the verbs and the skills as a starting point to the staff because they were able to say, okay, yep, that's where I know what that looks like. And I know when I ask students to do those things that they're unistructural. Multistructural is the next solo level and that's where uh, the the student has several ideas and they know several things about the, the task that you're talking about or the topic that you're talking about uh, and they can perform several tasks in isolation, not, not really together. So if you look at the verbs and the skills that are attached to that, that is describing, combining, listing, summarising, giving examples, performing serial skills. Now they're not the only things in the verbs and the skills and there might be uh, what, what it means in one area may be slightly different in another subject area. So, but it's a starting point and it's a really positive, simple starting point. These two areas of unistructural and multistructural are, are very much 
surface level learning. So where we have wrote a lot of rote recitation, um, and if we look at our curriculums, and I challenge you with this, and if you go and have a look after the presentation or during the week with your colleagues or have a look yourself, um, have a look at the verbs that are there and, and highlight them in yellow and green and see what, what your own planning or your own, um, your own term planners are looking like. Are they looking like the verbs and the skills that's in the yellow or are they looking like the verbs and the skills in the green? The next level is uh, the green and we really talk about the yellow and the green and I'll show you some examples as we go through of, of, some, um, of, of how teachers have used the yellow and the green within the school. So it's been a really exciting journey and I really congratulate uh, the teachers that I've been working with. I've given them a starting point and then they've taken their own creativity and um, curiosity about how to use this and, and they've done some wonderful things. So if we're going into the next level of, of solo, this is where uh, the relations are being formed. So the students are able to link ideas and skills together to start to really solve complex problems or tasks, they're able to integrate knowledge into a bit more of a structure. They're able to analyse, argue, compare, contrast, classify, sequence, explain, criticise, justify, relate, distinguish and organise. And we can see here that it, they're quite different to the surface level skills that we're asking. Um, and often when we've got very quick lessons, we tend to move into that more of the yellow zone because that's what we're able to get a very quick answer or a really quick understanding of the answers that we want. As we start moving into deeper and more conceptual understanding, um, we're, we're finding out new things and they're really answers from the students or areas that the students can go beyond what we know. So this is where extended abstract is and this is where students can generate knowledge into new ideas. They can use ideas um, and their skills in new and different ways. And so this is what we really want from a student where if we've got an English lesson uh, and we want them to take what they've learnt in that English lesson and move it into a maths lesson and really what we know is that when it comes to um, transfer of knowledge and um, reading comprehension is that to really, for things to become sticky uh, and, and to really move from subject to subject, they really need to be an extended abstract. And if we look at what we ask our year 11 and 12 students to, um, no matter what state they're in in Australia or whether it's in America or the UK, when they're finishing uh, their schooling, we really need them to be thinking in that extended abstract way and writing in that extended abstract way where they're able to evaluate or reflect, predict, create, uh, design, compose, construct, prove and generate and this is what we want out of our whole uh, world learners to um, what they need. Now I've just seen that Danielle said that it reminds uh, her of Bloom's taxonomy so I'm glad that you um, brought that up and Peggy because it is similar to Bloom's taxonomy um, but to just give you a bit of a background on Bloom's and as I was going through the research, Bloom's taxonomy was designed not for our students. It wasn't designed in that way. It was designed at a university level for university students and was really taken into the classroom and, and became a part of the classroom for a long time. But it was never really built in that way and it was quite complex and it, it, wasn't, it didn't have the simplicity or the structure that the solar taxonomy has. So, Given that there's these very five clear levels and there's two, we, you know, I really leave that red or that pink level out, but the yellow and the green, to start thinking in that yellow and green way is a lot simpler than, than Bloom's taxonomy. So I, I really think that the, that Bloom's confused a lot of people and what the, the best part about the solo taxonomy that I've found is that, um, it, it, you're able to develop a, a common language between student and teachers and teacher to teacher, whereas Bloom's is a lot more complex than that. And Peggy, I've just noticed that um, you've popped Pam Hook's website up there. Amazing resources on Pam Hook's website. She's an absolute genius in the area of solid taxonomy and, and really quite an inspiring person in this area. Um, this does make sense. It made sense to teachers and 
when I introduced it to teachers, they were saying, yeah, I think I'm doing this. And they may have been doing it, but they weren't speaking the common language to each other and to their students. So the students at our school, after a year, now talk about the yellow and they talk about the green. The teachers are marking in that way. Uh, I heard a teacher, one of the art teachers, say the other day, and I love this, and in fact, if I write a book about the solo taxonomy, which I hope to, I would love to use this title. I think that um, to one of the art teachers said that um, they were asking their students to follow the yellow brick road to the Emerald City. And I just, I haven't been able to, I heard that last week and I thought, wow, I'm so excited by that because that's where the magic happens. That is where the magic happens at the Emerald City and every learner should be able to um, get to the Emerald City. What's happened in the past, and as I said, I've got an ed support background, is that a lot of kids within the ed support context or students with learning difficulties or disabilities, um, their day, every day at school, sits within the yellow. So we think that we're doing the right thing by, and we are in, in many ways, students have to go through the yellow. The yellow is as important as the green, but we keep students in the yellow far too often, and particularly students with learning difficulties, they know. They, they are able to go into the green and they deserve to go in the green, so, you know, there needs to be steps and, and perhaps they would stay in the yellow for a lot longer than the other students, but they need opportunities to get to the green. Then you've got the, on the other side where you're able to, um, the students who really start off in the green and, and again, they shouldn't have every, every lesson every day sitting in the yellow. So I really, um, I really think that students, um, you know, it's, it's about not teaching the known and using your data effectively and that type of thing as well. Okay. Keep going here. So if we're looking at deep learning, this is quite a nice diagram. Um, these are some of the pictures that come from Pam Hook where you're able to really think about unistructural singularly, multistructural with separately relational, that diagram that um, starts to link it together and extend it abstract. And if you are familiar with understanding by design, then um, this solar taxonomy works really well with, with UBD. Another example, so for the student, I need help, I can't start the task, I don't want to. Um, uni, I, I have that single idea, multi, I have a number, relational starting to, to link them in, in different ways and extended abstract, having a number of ideas and applying to a new context. There's a really nice YouTube example um, and I didn't put it on here because I didn't have time within this presentation, I, I knew that it would take up too much time, but if you look up um, solar taxonomy and Lego, there's a really lovely example where the, the unistructural is like one Lego brick and the multistructural is like a couple of Lego bricks but not yet stuck together or perhaps stacked on top of each other. And relational is where you've got your instructions and I have a seven-year-old and a ten-year-old so they're a boy and a girl constantly using Lego so I see this occurring all the time and relational is where the children have got that those instructions in front of them uh, and they're starting to put things together but with instructions and then extended abstract when you've got all that Lego and it's going everywhere and they're able to come up with something really cool from their knowledge of the relational element of putting it together with instructions and now being able to just create whatever they want but something even better and, and wonderful. Um, so for me, why K-12 solo? And the reason I keep coming back to K-12 is really that it can actually fit in any context. Whether you're in kinder or whether you are a year 12 student going for your um, entrance examinations to university here in Melbourne, if they see exams, you're really able to use solo as a teacher. As soon as you learn these skills, you can use it within your classroom. The more your teachers are, are using it, the more common language that 
that's actually occurring. Um, you can really start to talk about your planning, your learning, the differentiation within your, your class, how to extend all students and not have that fixed mindset of grouping students. Um, and a lot of the research tells us that if at the beginning of the year we've got a list and we, you know, we know that they're the, they're the students at the bottom or the students um, in the middle and the students at the top, that that's where they'll come out. So we want to really use Solo to shake things up a little bit and find out what these students can really do. So that whole notion of working collaboratively, speaking a common language, staff students in the wider community, and for us at our school, this year is the year that we will start to stretch that out to the wider community and to parents so that they've got that understanding as well and can share the journey. Um, so just a few points, this is a bit of a busy slide, but just to say that um, and for you guys to keep when I pass this on to you, but Solo is a really effective tool. Now remember it's a tool, it's not the be all and end all, but it is definitely a wonderful tool that helps uh, teachers to implement a common language. And it teaches students to learn how to learn. Students really, um, much like what John Hattie talks about, is really the students know where they are, where they need to go, so what success looks like and how they're going to get there. So. Using Solo makes learning visible for both student and teacher, able to really scaffold your learning, encourage higher order thinking skills to be developed for all students, um, can effectively be uh, used as a tool for monitoring progress along the way, um, planning to meet the requirements of whether it's in America the Common Core State Standards or the requirements that we have um, here in Australia. Uh, Sorry, the reason I have that Common Core State Standards, I had um, taken this from a slide that I presented at last year in America with John Hattie at the Visible Learning Conference uh, in San Diego. So I was really trying to stretch it out and, and say it can be used in any context. Um, the exciting thing about Solo is that together students and teachers can share really effective dialogue, um, design and action learning intentions and learning experiences identify and use effective strategies and success criteria and provide feedback and assessing student outcomes. Reflect on where to go next so students and teachers have clarity on this. Um, does anyone want to ask me any questions at this stage? Because I feel like I'm doing everything that I said that I shouldn't be, that I'm giving you guys a lot of monologues and a lot of information. So does anyone at this stage um, want to ask any questions? I'm just having a... Okay, yep, so SOLO, Structure of Observer and the Outcomes, yep, it is the acronym for that. Not the drink and, and certainly not alone. But, you know, I actually struggle with the name, the SOLO taxonomy. I absolutely love the concepts of it, but um, I think by, as a researcher, I can understand SOLO taxonomy from university um, and researcher aspect, but I think within a school, um, within a school context, I think that it, it would be better to to um to think of a different name. Uh, I think it would be easier to grasp uh, if there was a different name. Let me just have a look, read on the side. How do you get teachers to realise that just by using verbs, it doesn't mean you are using solid? Um, yeah, that's a good point. So basically. Um, Vanessa's question about how do you get them to just by using the, the verbs that you're actually using solo. Um, it, it's actually more of the verbs or more of a starting point. So I kind of, as I said, they were really busy. They, had, they were doing a lot of amazing things in the school. But I really wanted to make sure that um, the teachers have something straight away to, to grasp onto. So the verbs are not the be all and end all and, and they're, they're really a, a positive starting point as to what does it look like. So I asked all the, the teachers, I worked with all the teachers from prep to 12 to say, okay, well let's check out our, our UBD planners and we will highlight words that match up to those verbs. And no surprise, and this would be the case in most schools, that most of it was yellow. But it was more the understanding for teachers. So um, if any teachers were sort of like, well, do I need to have green or how much green do I need to have? 
Well, you actually need to have both. You need to start off with, with the yellow. The yellow is really important, but certainly if there's way too much yellow, then it's an issue. If there's way too much green, it's an issue. And it's not a balance of half half. It's really a, a balance of what do the students need, but by providing those opportunities to both. Um, I love this slide because I just think that it, it, it shows that it provides opportunities for all students. And I just think that um, the more that we can do for all students and the more that we can say to every student within a class, and it's not to say that, well, here's extended abstract and you're all going to get there by this stage, but I think it really um, allows students to know what success looks like and to know how, how to break down how to get there. So I really like that one. I'm going to give you some practical examples now of some students within my own school context. Um, so can I get a, um, a bit of a, a, are we able to have a look at where our participants are? Are they primary or are they secondary? Are we able to have a look sure, at I'll that? I'll just quickly set up a little um, poll for you. And I'll keep going on this. Okay, primary, primary, secondary. Okay. I think it's useful for anyone who, whether it is not in a classroom or secondary. Um, great, we've got a real mixture of everyone. So that's what I, I love about working in a, um, just having a read of where everyone's from. Excellent. It does work for all grade levels and that's the coolest thing about this. So um, I'm going to share a couple of the examples from my own school that, it, that, are, that are from Prep 12 and it really gives you a really great examples of, um, of how the, the, it works. And this is a starting point. So oh, these slides actually, we, we started the journey at the beginning of, the la of last year and these slides were developed uh, last year. So I actually think that my um, interest in all ages is great. Um, it, I think that it, it shows that for now we would actually be able, we would be at a completely different level. So it will be exciting the next stage of where our teachers are in this journey. But this is the beginning. This is about a starting point. So these prep students. Um, started looking at solo and the, they, the teachers said in the beginning that what they would do is they would look at those verbs and they would look at the, um, how they could use those verbs in their planning and move more to identify, describe, compare, create, to create higher expectations for their students. So rather than asking prep students who are five straight away um, just to list and define things around the school as they were investigating their school community, they wanted to see what what the student could do, and this is this is what they started to do. Now they, the students didn't write this, but this is what the teachers started to use the language within solo straight away within prep. So what's happening here is these are some prep examples of um, the students were asked to get to know the school. And they were looking at the library and they were looking at the canteen. So I'll just read this aloud. So describing, the library is somewhere where you choose books and you read. It sounds quieter. With whispering voices, we can hear voices of people playing outside. There are a lot of books in there and they get borrowed. The people in the library put the books on a tower so the people can borrow them. They teach people to read in the library. So that was a really good example of a student describing. They verbally said that and the teacher described. Um, comparing, so this is really cool. This is where the prep teacher said, we may not have asked them to do this. We, we may have stuck to the describing. So let's have a look together at, at this example. So if we look at comparing the canteen and the library. So the canteen and the library are not the same because the canteen doesn't have books and the library doesn't have food. You read books in the library and you buy food in the canteen. Both have chairs and people. You have to go inside of both of them. The same is that you scan, that you like scanning them and then you can have it. In the canteen you scan the food and you have 
that you have and in the library you scan books. So I really think that this is a really good example because what it was doing was really challenging their thinking straight away to say, well, if we're going to start comparing and contrasting, not describing, we're actually changing our expectations from prep. So I'm really excited for the school to see how if this thinking is continuous, what sort of impact it will have across the school. So I'll give you some more examples of how people did it across the school. So you two teacher had described that when they introduced the language of solo, they said, this is a way of looking at our thinking and our learning and seeing where we're at. We looked at solo diagrams, discussed what each picture represented as a starting point. So that's how they started to introduce it. Um, they showed the, the class what it meant. And then what they did, what this teacher did was she said, she put down the, uh, the different pictures because she had shown them this diagram here and had it up on the wall and laid these down. And then what they were doing, they were starting a unit on toys and, and different types of toys and asked students to pose a question um, or state what they knew about toys. And then they all stood around the examples that these different areas um, that were on the floor, the different levels of understanding, and together, one by one, they put down, what do you think your understandings are? Now that we've we recognise this, where are our understandings? And what happened was, the students together could see that at the beginning of their unit that all of the questions were very surface level. And what it showed them was the teacher said, okay, that's great, we're starting the unit, you're starting at this level and that's where we should be starting and it's my job to teach you and, and we're going to do this together so that we are in this extended abstract. So they knew straight away, she said it was one of the most powerful lessons that she'd had in her teaching career because it was the first time that she could clearly articulate her thoughts in the way of how could she do this with the students so that she knew that visually and perceptually they knew exactly where they were going. So that was really exciting. This is what she said. Um, most of our thinking was in the yellow zone. The key for my children was knowing that we wanted our thinking in the green zone, yet understanding the importance of yellow. So I was glad that um, she was able to articulate that and understand that too. She asked the students, how do we move our thinking and our learning into the green zone? And this is where she said she talked to them about the sort of things that um, she would be doing to get their thinking and learning into the green zone. So I said to her, how is it helping? She said that she keeps reinforcing the green zone thinking and learning and that their children are able to ask themselves, what do I know, how am I going and what to next? Um, it supports students reflecting on their own thinking. It helps teachers to thoughtfully shape learning intentions and learning experience. And it made it easily and effectively um, effective to use success criteria. I'd be really interested to know, um, particularly moving into a PhD uh, with John Hattie in Solo Taxonomy, how all of you, uh, you know, are using similar things or what do you think when you see these examples, how does it match up with what you're doing within your own school context because um, as I said this matched in really well with understanding by design but you know I'd really like to know what experiences you bring and how do you uh, see this fitting so if you could email me that would be super. Um, I'll show you some more examples, so this is a year three teacher, they had been looking at uh, um, solo with symbols and icons using flags and they again, um, I'll let you have a read of that. He had put it into his own words with the flag. I'll, if you have a read of that, I'll have a read of some of your questions and comments.
yeah, yeah really interesting point. Um, he said that these teachers started to really get the students to think about what it meant to be green. Um, yeah, to answer that, your question, Peggy, on the side, um, how am I going? Yep, it's how am I doing? I guess that the how am I going comes from the work of John Haddon who, who says, uh, really, where am I? Where do I need to go to achieve success and how am I going to get there? And certainly some of the language when Peggy went on um, presented in America last year, I, yeah, changed a lot of that language, but I think that um, it is exactly as you said there. Um, this is what the year three teacher said. Now when they complete a learning outcome, a challenge for students to describe the colour of their thinking. So the colour of the thinking has really had so much impact across our school for both students and teachers. But I would say in particular for teachers. So that's where it's been absolutely huge. The language of students using uh, this in the classroom tells me how much of their thinking is changing. So I really love how, how that's occurring and there's so much to share about this. Um, in senior school it's a bit different and it was really great to see how different areas across the school were using it. And so straight away in load, um, Helen, I'll be able to give you a copy of um, the slides at the end, so absolutely. Uh, Lote was starting to put it up on the, the wall, and this was really to articulate their own learning intentions, which was great. And so what, what was happening here within this classroom was just really articulating the learning intentions of the lesson and knowing that this, this to me, just makes that learning within that class. Now, Lope being learning um, other than English, so it was a Japanese class, uh, and um, it was this, it was really nice to see how the teachers were using that. In English, they came up with this really cool idea of the solo head. So the solo heads are now used, and they've actually even become a lot more complex, and um, the students love the solo heads, and it, they're able to articulate every single lesson using a solo head. So they start off now using these solo heads to, um, to talk to the students about what their expectations are, their high expectations, and what it means, and, and what, where they require their students to go. And I, I think that it's been so powerful and, and such a lovely example um, of how to use that. This is what they also use within the context of the English classroom. So you can see the notion of this yellow and green really coming through on everything. So when we're talking to students, for example, it says they're talking about um, questions to get you thinking deeply about your hero. You, to be able to go green, you have to do some work in yellow thinking. So again, it's really reiterating that message of solo and what it means to go green and here's what we need to do. So they've actually taken those verbs a little bit further and they've integrated it. Self-assessment rubrics again, so they're able to really talk the green and, and the yellow and it's really kind of um, taken this lovely journey throughout the, the whole school. In science, when they're planning, the planners are starting to look like this. So you can really start to see that the thinking across the school has changed and as I said at the beginning of the presentation, when I went through their UVD planners, it was mostly yellow. There was a lot of yellow. So to really see this movement and this acceptance of yellow and green and this knowledge of importance of yellow and green um, was such a great visual representation, as you say, um, Peggy, it, it sure is. So we went from rubrics that looked like this to start to look like this across the board. Now, I didn't tell teachers um, this is what you need to, this is what you need to do, this is how you need to do it. I really wanted to see, as I said, their own curiosity about solid taxonomy and creativity come through. Um, and I really think that that's what's occurred. You stick with the common language of what the four levels of understanding are um, and 
and the colours have been really powerful as well. I've integrated it into, I oversee all of the data that within the school um, and even the way that we look at our data in the school, whether, and I'm talking about more standardised assessments like our NAPSLAN data or our TASH assessments, which are our yearly tracking and monitoring assessments, we put into um, yellow and green. So for senior school maths, when they're marking some assessments, they're able to use some highlighters to really look at different components of green and yellow. Um, so again, that active language is solo. So coming back to the original um, question of what, what, did, what does uh, effective classroom discourse look like and the importance of questioning and the importance of really effective dialogue that moves students from surface level learners to deep level learners, the solo taxonomy has really done that That for me. I would like to learn more about it. I would like to be able to see it um, being used in a lot more schools and classrooms. Um, and as I have kept talking about in the presentation, it ensures that every student has the opportunity to move from surface to deep level learning um, in every classroom and engage in active and ongoing dialogue to develop that common language with students that know, that allow them to know where they are and where they need to go to achieve success and most importantly that shared understanding of how they're going to get there. Um, I always think about and I think that John Hattie's really taught me this about changing the narrative and really what is the narrative and what is the story and the importance of evaluation and how do I know that this is working. So. Um, that, that's a really important step that within your own classroom and as a school. So I just wanted to come back to something that we had focused on within our school, which was every child, every moment, and that lovely sentiment by an art teacher of um, follow the yellow brick road to the Emerald City and adding on this is where the magic happens. Um, Make learning visible through high expectations, deep level learning and ongoing dialogue for success to occur to maximise all learning opportunities. And that is um, my email there. That is my Uni of Melbourne email. So that's probably the best email to get me on. Um, and yeah, I, I will definitely get back to you and be able to provide you with more information about either solar taxonomy or effective classroom discourse or teacher talk and um, effective questioning as well. So um, I'll just answer a couple of questions if you like. So Peggy, you said if you wanted to evaluate classrooms for student teacher levels of question, would you be able to use a rubric as an observation tool? Absolutely. Yep, we've created some of those. and. Um, Continuing to do so, there's an exceptional, um, also an exceptional, um, what would I call it, program called Visible Classrooms that looks at um, effective classroom discourse and teacher talk where they can come into uh, your class and um, if you look it up under Visible Classrooms, you're able to see what they can do and come in and evaluate your teacher talk. So um, Peggy, I know that they're doing that throughout the states. Um, you can either call, speak to Mike at Corwin, um, who publishes John Hattie's work, um, or AI Media, they, they also do that as well. So yeah, there's lots of different areas that I can point you in a direction of helping you further with either solo taxonomy or um, or discourse, but good luck with your journey with it. And um, yeah, I've loved it in, in 20 years of teaching. It's certainly been the most exciting journey that I've had um, in an impact with kinder to 12 teachers and students. So I think it's a fun and exciting journey. So thank you for, for being a part of my presentation today. I really enjoyed doing it and um, would love to hear about your narratives and your stories as well. So, and I'm sure that John would love to hear about them too. So, um, if you've got questions for myself or John, then you can certainly pop them my way and I can send them on to him. Or um, if you've got them for me, I'm very happy to answer them and, and talk with you further. Thank you.
Fantastic. Thank you so much, so I think that was a wonderful presentation. Um, we'd like to thank you very much for being the final keynote um, of our, our conference and, and to end in that way, it's kind of uh, almost uh, uh, the, the climax and, and you kind of think, well, what's next? So thank you very much. Um, solo taxonomy is certainly an interesting way of thinking. And I, I really appreciate um, the time you've put into to being here today. So thank you very much, Sophie. Thank Everyone, you. if you'd like to give her a round of applause, where well, you can see the smiley face below your name, you'll find one that says applause, and we'll give her a virtual round of applause. A place to make contact as well. I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Lovely. Um, now, Coach Carol, you wanted to say a few things. I did indeed. I can't resist having the last word. You know me. Let me just adjust that for you. I thought it was worthwhile to pop over to the community and put in my own reflections on Aussie Live 2015. So I thought I'd just spend a minute with you here to let you know that you can do the same. You can go across to this link in the Ning community to my posting of today about three fabulous days of education conversations. You can grab the badge, I was there, attended, and you can also give me your feedback in a comment at the bottom of that posting, so making it really, really simple. But if you want to go a step further and you want to put your reflections into your own blog, you can use that link to your blog in your application for a certificate. And the certificate that you need, as she says, going quickly to where the certificates are, I'll give you that link as well. Uh, these um, are really useful for those who want credit for having been at any one of our presentations in Aussie Live 2015. So go to that page if you want to do your certificates. I'm happy for you to just put any of your feedback for Sophie's fabulous keynote continuing here in the text chat and then you can save the whole lot. In the meantime, quietly in the background, the Aussie Live community has grown to 246 and several of those have joined us over the last few days. The site remains live for the rest of the year and will be round again next year with another conference. If you want more of the badges, let me just get that link for you too. Do I have it? I don't have it open. Okay, you'll find it in my posting if you want to go there. And finally, yes, planning in my own head has begun for 2016. So do you have some ideas? Do you have keynote speakers you'd like to invite back? Please pop their names into the text chat now or onto the whiteboard. And would you like to present? If you haven't yet had a chance, perhaps you'd like to do the same. So I'll leave you to ponder those questions and please feel, feel free to put them on the whiteboard or in the text chat. I have a huge thank you to make to the team, in particular to <laughs> Ness for being my right hand woman. <laughs> she has been there at all hours of the morning and evening, as I have, eating a breakfast, lunch and dinner at the desk. <laughs> yes, Julie, I've put a link to where you get your certificate. Just scroll back in the text chat and have a look. I want to say thank you to the rest of my team. And I think we need to bring in a new member. Jo Frey has been an enormous help and I think she needs to be an official member. Don't know how she feels about it, but we'd like to vote you in. We've had Anne Mershon, we've had Janita Lyon, and we have had Shingo, and Shingo's here today, and Vanessa Crouch, and myself, and Amy Brinkley in the background, who is from USA. So a big shout out to you, Amy. Thank you heaps. And thank you to all our presenters. We really appreciate your time. I hope you've had fun. And of course, finally, to mention Shambles right at the end is a particular pleasure for me to do so because he's going to convert, or will, sorry, we will convert the recordings of the webinars to MP4s and then Shambles is going to put them up into our channel in YouTube. And a link to that is in my posting in the community. Thank you to the comments that are coming in. 
I really hope that you enjoyed all of them. Thanks. Uh, back to you, Les, to close the session. Thanks so much, Carol. Um, so thank you again to everyone. It's been a fantastic weekend. Um, I'm glad this only happens once a year because I am exhausted and I'm sure there are lots of other people feeling the same way. And I do know that I'll be going back and watching some of the webinars that I wasn't able to be present in. So thank you again and thank you once again, Sophie. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone.